Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Francisco Serrano. I'm a data scientist at Nubank in Mexico, working in credit strategy. Hi, everyone. I'm Pedro, a uh, machine learning engineer uh, here at the bank. Uh, I also also working uh, in the Mexico team, uh, in the credit, credit, credit strategy team more, more specifically, uh, but I'm based on, on Brazil. Um, and that's it. Like, uh, let's continue, friend. And we are going to talk about how it was for us in the first year of launching Nubank's credit card in Mexico. So most of us have played around with machine learning, learned some mysteries of neural networks, and maybe have even entered a, a Kaggle competition. But this isn't nearly as simple as incorporating these solutions into a live business application. Having a trained machine learning model is just the starting point. There are many other considerations and components that need to be built, tested, and deployed for a functioning application. And actually, a lot of it has to do with the previous talks. Um, what we are going to briefly talk about is not about building and deploying these components, but about the amazing thing it is to find out that you already have tons of cool, well-made infrastructure and tools that are extremely helpful when building machine learning models and for them to fully work and have business value. This is what happened when we started developing ML solutions for Nubank in Mexico. Having all the experience and tools from the data science team in Brazil enabled us to grow at an incredibly fast pace. And I don't know if you've seen La Casa de Papel or Money Heist in English, but this is making reference to shipping models really fast as if we were printing money, turning data science in Mexico to La Casa de los Modelos. And now we're gonna go through the stages of a data science project and how having this mature team and experience helped us on each one of them. Okay, so the first thing you need is the project scope. What is the problem and how are you going to solve it? This could become a very difficult part in any project. Fortunately, as data scientists in Mexico, we count on the formula which applies to attack and solve many problems. For example, building a, a credit risk model and making a policy for it. This is deciding who to accept as a client and providing them with a credit line. This, of course, was already done in Brazil, and we just needed to build a model with Mexico's data and apply this formula that's already working there. Uh, what about fraud detection, the amount of the initial credit lines we should give, or credit line increments for our current customers? This happens to a lot of the ML applications we have working. We mainly need to focus on having good data. OK, so about data. I guess that that's a very big starting point for us in Mexico. We, in this sense, we relied a lot on the platform that uh, Leonardo presented earlier, but we still had to populate it. So this was a big bottleneck in our development in Mexico, uh, especially for the uh, frontline models that uh, Fran mentioned. So for approving uh, like customers to a credit card or to detect fraudsters and as, or assign an initial credit line for, for customers, this all, all happened like a, most of the cases like the first day, day of life uh, in the, of the bank customer. Uh, and we, we don't have uh, data about that. Like uh, we, we need to get this data from somewhere. Uh, and in our case, we need to, to work a lot with uh, external data providers. Uh, so we could have like features for, for a model. And this, this was our, our main focus. Uh, and this, this is not only uh, like for, for, from an analytical perspective in the sense that, oh, I need to evaluate and see how valuable that, that uh, like data is and do feature engineering on top of it. We had to, to really uh, start from scratch. So negotiate with uh, like th those, those providers, uh, like tr tr try to get some samples, evaluate if it's uh, valuable to move forward with uh, engineering integration to get that uh, data dynamically. Uh, so this was a, a big effort for us uh, in our uh, first, first year. Uh, and and we, we really, Try to, to make data a first class citizen and since that uh, this is uh, like a top priority that we would use like a for, for, for a long time um, and it would affect many 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 models uh, at, at, at the bank uh, and the, the other front that we also worked on uh, a lot in this first year was on building uh, internal experiments so one thing is to buy data but there is also data that we that we can uh, design on our own, like, uh, like maybe on, on how we manage th those, those customers. Um, 
Yeah, like so that that's like a our main task uh, that we 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 worked on, on our, our first year of development. Uh, so for the next stage of a uh, development model, we would have research and development. Okay. So what are the things we need from having this this idea and this formula to actually implementing it? There are a series of steps we need to take to, to build a solution, right? One of them is what Pedro just mentioned. Data is the most important part because it is the raw material of data scientists. And math and statistics combined with computer science are our tools. We can skip to the next. So after having the data the way we need it, this is being processed and ETLs in place, we get to the fun part, which is building your ML algorithm and making sure all the steps are, are done correctly. Having the pipeline working properly, creating the necessary transformations on training data and applying them on new data. And for this, we actually have an open source machine learning library named FKLearn, which uses functional programming principles to make it easier to solve real problems with machine learning. Also, with FKLearn, you can make feature selection, hyperparameter optimization, and even calibration to define the model's architecture so that everything is in place for, for deployment. Then we have to, to validate our results. This is a, a very important part when developing an ML solution. And it is evaluating the model's performance and the integrity of your data, so inputs and outputs. Whether it is to, to perform EDA, which stands for Exploratory Data Analysis, to make sure that the distributions of your inputs are consistent, checking the proportion of null values, checking if your features, feature importance, and sharp values make sense, or just knowing if your model is gonna be useful and improve what we already have in production, we have a lot of functions stored and shared, and even a checklist of the validations needed to be done for each model to be approved. Uh, we also adapted in Mexico the model approval rituals they already performed in Brazil. This is to update the model on a, a model development on a regular basis, having model design meetings, and the final model approval meeting with the data science managers, business analysts, and even some stakeholders to go in detail about the whole development process. So having this kind of checklist of the things you need to get your model approved is incredibly hel helpful and speeds up the process. Okay, so now we, we, that we have like designed the model, uh, implemented it, and validated it, uh, we still uh, haven't necessarily put it in production. Uh, and for like this internal standardization stage, uh, this is something that uh, we, we leveraged a lot, the, the knowledge that we had in, in Brazil. Uh, basically, we, we reused the whole, whole infrastructure. Uh, so everything that we use to deploy models in Brazil works the same in Mexico. Uh, initially, you had like some minor tweaks to our infrastructure to support Mexico, but it's, it pales in comparison to the effort that it was to uh, develop it in Brazil the first time and all, all the iterations uh, that infrastructure had. Um, yeah, like a, once the model is delivered, it is uh, already integrated with our, our policies. Uh, is it done? Well, no. Then it's a, the, like a, maybe the final step and another step that we leverage a lot of the infrastructure that we, we have uh, in Brazil, which is to, to monitor our model. So we, we have, have a, a platform that attracts metrics of our, of our models, uh, met, met, tracks us as well the, the features and the, the distributions. And so it generates all, all the, the interesting dashboards. Uh, and maybe the, the only part that will be a little bit different be like a business um, monitoring that could be a little bit more uh, customized and more specific to, to Mexico scenario. Uh, but other than that, like we really used a lot of the infrastructure that we had in Brazil. Um, and then that, that's it. Like that, that's a whole like a model cycle, a, a simplified view. Uh, maybe I could talk now about a little bit uh, about the, the results we, we had uh, in the first year. So yeah, I could say like the first year we released. Well, I, I cannot say that. Like we can say like how many customers released uh, we, we, we had, but I can at least say like some references, some re relative metrics that we had uh, in this time. So. If the, the addition of our uh, ML models, we were able to uh, triple the approval rate while keeping the risk constant. So let me uh, try to clarify that a little bit. So approval rate is uh, the fraction of the prospects, the, the, the people that apply uh, to, to get a credit card, how many of them do we approve? So that's the approval rate. And the risk is, is a, a metric that we have for um, as a proxy for, for people paying us uh, or not. 
like uh, we kill, if we'll, if we could we could lend money to them and maybe they won't pay us and that's not good but we were still able to uh, keep the risk constant while increasing a lot of the approval rate uh, and that is, is a really a, a deal breaker in this first year um, so we, we are able to get up to speed uh, a, a lot and like this like what the, the frontline models uh, enable us so approving customers uh, assigning lines and also detecting fraudsters um, and also like what, what else can I say about, about oh the first year we, we also increased a lot uh, in the data science team, we started with uh, four people, uh, the big like uh, like last year, and now we have uh, we are at eleven, almost twelve, soon to be twelve, and we're still hiring. So there is still many many opportunities, uh, things that we want not only to like uh, follow the trend from Brazil, but also uh, like there are some specific use cases that we we ha have in Mexico as well. So there is space to to innovate. Um, and that's it. Like uh, that's our uh, lessons from from this first year. Uh, and ML was like a, a played a big part on on that growth. Uh, so yeah, do, do you have any questions? Feel free to uh, ask about like I don't know infrastructure. There are there are things that are confidential about the business. So that's why like the presentation was a bit high level. But uh, I'll try to answer the best of my knowledge. Great. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Francisco. Um, so we have a few questions here. The first one is, how do you monitor, sorry, machine learning models in production? As I said, like there are like a, for the, the a modern platform, we have like three main types uh, of, of, of dashboards. So we, we follow like the features distribution. Uh, we can like see if they, the distribution is matching like the one that was expected uh, in training. Uh, we can also follow like the metrics of the model themselves as we score them. Um, so like, for example, if it's a classification model, we could follow the UC. Problem of that is that you have a, a, a lag uh, between the time that you like, score the model and uh, until you get like the real uh, target we, that, that could happen in some scenarios. Uh, so we could, and then we go back to the features. Um, one other type of monitoring that is very important for, for us is uh, that for, Comparing uh, the like models that we have in real time with uh, models that we like we have in batch, like the same model deployed in different ways, is just because like in real time we may have inconsistencies uh, that we don't find in batch, and the batch is closer to what we had in training. So we also monitor that. Uh, and beyond that, we have uh, like one thing is to monitor uh, and have dashboards in place, and another thing is like finding the problem if there is any. So we are also setting up like alarms for the most important metrics are like the model scores. Um, so we, we don't need to like keep an eye on it every day um, and use it more as a debug tool. All right. Um, the next question is, is there any index or limit for the machine learning model, model error in the case of Mexico? Sure. So, so like a, there is a, like an index that we need to, to match uh, in this first year. Well, like uh, one thing that uh, maybe it would help, like in the, in the very, very beginning, uh, like we had no, no references. So like uh, it is the same challenge that uh, Matthias mentioned earlier. So we had to, to work with like baselines. Uh, and from there, like uh, once we, we started working with our models, even though we had like uh, fewer, like small, small data sets, we, we, we could compare with that baseline. Uh, and that was uh, our reference. Yeah, and I think a, a very important part here is to, to make sure that your validations are, are done correctly, that they don't contain leakage and, and you're doing it correct to be sure that the new solution is going to improve what you already have. What is the, I mean, this is, this is again monitoring. So what is a good first approach to a good monitoring pipeline? So I guess if you don't have anything yet, like what would you do first? It, it kind of depends of, uh, on the application, the scenario. Uh, if you have like a, a fast uh, response and like a, you can, you can find, know about your the real target uh, fast, and then, then you can like just follow the, the metrics of the model. That's usually uh, more uh, helpful uh, to, to despite like big problems. Uh, but it, it really depends a lot. In some scenarios, you can score and like 
having like just finding the real target is, is expensive. You need to like pay for it, uh, maybe. Uh, and just just about waiting. Uh, so it, it, it really depends. But I'll focus more like on, on the output and try to use the have the metrics that we had like on validation uh, for the model in production as well. <laughs> what is your infrastructure stack like? Cloud on premise or hybrid? Uh, it, everything we, we have it's uh, in the cloud. Uh, like a, is, it, is, it, is that the question? Like, a, oh, do we have like a, it, like, yeah. a like real hardware? Like, no, everything is, is in the cloud. We have not, nothing uh, physical. That's like a, a quick answer. Uh, is the stack used in Mexico identical to the one in Brazil? If not, what changes? Yeah, I would say it's the same stack. Like, uh, like, like we didn't like really change anything. Like, uh, of course, like things develop differently. Uh, like some products work different, uh, differently uh, in Mexico. Uh, so, like some of the our internal services may have like a different architecture. But in terms of the stack, the tools that we use. Um, they are like exactly the same. Like we avoid like having overhead uh, on our tools. And like, for example, I used to work on, on Brazil and I moved to Mexico, so I'm familiarized with everything. Um, and we do, we don't really see a need to like be different. Uh, we have like all the support uh, from Brazil exactly because we use the, the same stack. Great. Uh, we have one last question. So, in your experience. Is it better to have an scalable machine learning model or to have specific models, for example, in all countries that uh, new has operations? Yeah. So I, I really wish we would have like a, a scalable solution and have like a, the same model uh, working on, on like different countries. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to do that uh, for some of our products like later on or some, some of the functionalities in the app that may use uh, machine learning. But as, as was, I was saying, like for the frontline models, so for uh, uh, proving customers um, and, and like detecting problems, th th things like that, uh, we, we really found the need to, to have like a specific uh, solutions for each country uh, because the data comes in very different format. Like the providers that we have in Brazil are not the same that we, we have in Mexico. So we, we cannot scale, but for app, app related things, maybe like a, I, I've seen like other companies doing like a hierarchical models, like in the sense of, oh, maybe like we have a, a model that is, is specific per country and, and then if they don't have enough data, they, they go one level up. So for example, we have Colombia uh, as well as, as a, a country. And they, they have like a, it, less data that we have today, like they are like started, they started later. They, so they could, not use like a maybe they could use like a a Brazilian model like a, 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 a not not a Brazilian model I'm talking about Brazil just because it's bigger but a world model for that country but once we reach a certain point we can like design uh, a specific solution as we have in Mexico um, it could have like something like that and have different different levels um, but yeah like in terms of like working in different structure it would be much better to be have one but it's hard for our application. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Francisco. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.